the first batch of Werewolf we did for the first movie, the design-wise, I think Len was very pleased, but there were some issues. I was offering him to have very big necks and things like this, and we realized that those necks were very stiff. Didn't allow the actor to move as well as he wanted to. And one of the biggest things that, that I wanted to change about the suits was the, the mobility with just the guy, just the, the actor's neck, because we had this fairly thick uh, neck on the on the werewolves and it's a it's a full solid piece of, of like foam rubber or whatever and so once once you got the guy in the suit he looks a bit like an action figure because he just moves around and is he looks like he's in a neck brace so this time I sat down with Patrick and 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 he and his guys designed a way that they would they would replace and I forget exactly what they used in the end of the day but it was much more of a fabric almost spandex material just in the neck area that he had free motion in his neck, but then it still kept everything else solid. The black werewolves are the same sculpts, but all redone, same mechanics. We structured the neck so they have a little more fluidity because of the hair levels on all the werewolves across the board. Um, we've sort of increased them to make it easier for the performers inside the suits. So the original wolf you saw in the first movie are now coming back but with much more hair on their skin. So it allows us to hide those necks, but now they move better. We really stuck tight to the original designs on the first one, and having done that, we said, okay, what can we adjust a little in the design to give Len more freedom in shooting him and give the guy inside the suit more freedom and safety, for that matter, to get all the shots needed for the show. So we went into the mask, and we built up all of the outer shell of it was a harder formed mask, and then inside, where you have the cheekbones and the jaw and the, you know, the eyebrows and everything, we did with a very, very thin layer so that the expression can still come through. Back actually on the first Underworld, we started to explore a couple ideas of selective density materials when we run the foam rubber. And what that kind of does is sort of let you choose your battles, where the folds are gonna happen in the suit, and try to match things more anatomically correct. Because the suits are, as, as big as they make the guys look, in a lot of areas they're very thin, and if you don't do some form of, uh, let's call it artistic reinforcement, they don't fold right in the muscle groups. And that's something that we've started then, and we just keep improving it. So uh, we're pretty happy with how the suits turned out this time. There's not much we'd improve on them. They're very tight-fitting suits, and we still do the same KY trick. We take the guy, once he's in the legs and the waist is attached, we slather his whole hand, arm, all the way up from here to his shoulder with KY and just kind of slip him into it. As suits go, this, is, this isn't yeah. bad. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like I'm sitting at home in front of my TV relaxing on my couch, but as suits go, this is nice. A big issue we had from the first one to the last one is we had a really small, uh, I guess we'd call it paw print, that we designed around on the first one, which looked really neat. But as far as a practical piece, it, it didn't really give the guys a, a strong platform, let's say, to walk off of. So one of the things we explored on this one is before we even built the suits, we did some wider paw prints and changed a few bits of the orientation on the leg extensions. Once we got one that the performers were really happy with, we then based the sculpts on what worked with the uh, foot pieces, kind of the reverse of the first one. So um, the guys do great on them. I mean, they can just stand there on one foot, do all kinds of crazy things they couldn't do on the first one. The leg extensions are pretty tremendous this go around. This is what they look like from the side. And uh, you'll see here, there's a cable in the back that's attached down at the bottom of the heel to prevent us from pitching too far forward. Kevin made these so that they're adjustable so that the feet can crank down so I don't have to work so hard to maintain my balance. Underworld 2 is much more technologically advanced in, uh, in our ability to uh, change parts um, for the ability of the performer to perform in a lifelike manner. Two, one, go! It should really help the creature do its best and, and look as realistic as possible. Okay, Kurt, head yep. down. Okay. Guys in the creature suits, I think it's, 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 it's quite a funny job to have, to be honest, because 
You look at these guys' resumes, and it's you know it's uh, you know I played uh, you know I, I I played the creature in Mimic, and I played Harry and the Hendersons, and I played you know and so these guys have these resumes, and when you actually start to work with them, you start to recognize them in other movies because of their movements. Like I know that you know our our uh, one of our guys that was playing William Brian Steele, he he had just come off of Doom and he was playing one of the creatures in Doom. But when I'm watching Doom, just the way that he rises into camera and the way that he the way that he performs, I can watch Doom and there's this creature just just full of, you know, there's this massive creature suit and I look and I go, I, I just see Brian. You know, I mean that's that's Brian right there. And so you start to recognize these guys through their makeup. You can still run. It's me. On this new movie, we have a new werewolf. We have William, which is a totally different take. Uh, in a sense, kind of more traditional werewolf, as you know, than more like a wolf head and things like this. The look on the William wolf, there's just a whole neat flow to the white one. It takes three guys on radios to do the animatronics, plus the performer inside. <laughs> Patrick and I actually went through a, a, a lot of designs in drawing the jawline and making it still look very threatening and, and sort of bulky so it looked mean and not this pointy, uh, you know, wily e. coyote look. And that's what happens quite a bit. So we actually have a fairly heavy pronounced jaw on, on, on William still. <laughs> Cool. The white wolf is more of like a hair type suit, so 70% of what you're seeing is actually meticulously hand tied hair pieces. So they're all patterned and tailored on top of an under sculpture and then hours and hours and more hours are spent in individually tying each little hair in. We feel bad whenever we cover them in blood and shoot them and stuff because they're, they're really beautiful. But those things happen. Our dental tech on this one is a guy named uh, Dave Benicky. His nickname is Eggs and uh, he pretty much did all the teeth on this show for us. So based on the designs on the original one, we tooth cast umpteen zillion actors and he <coughs> has to hand, sculpt, cast, run the whole process through. Um, first what we do is we actually take an impression of the actor's teeth and this is uh, Tony Curran. This is uh, a cast of Tony's teeth that starts out this way and then uh, I'll take uh, sculpting wax and uh, actually sculpt the, the shape and form of the teeth. This is a dental acrylic. It's a, a powder which we then mix with this dental monomer. You can see it's kind of a toxic solvent. It's actually melting the writing off the, the bottle itself. Uh, we mix those two together. We pour it into one of these molds. Here we are, vampire teeth. Everything has to be done on articulators so we can uh, reproduce the actor's real bite because Tony has a lot of dialogue in this. We want to make sure that he's able to speak and you know everything moves, you know, so he's not restricted in any way with his performance with the way that the teeth fit. I know what you've done, Celine. And we have the Marcus character, which is another take on the vampire. We go back into the origins and uh, you start seeing what a full-blown vampire creature looks like. He has an initial uh, fresh out of his, his sarcophagus look, which is uh, kind of going back to the first film. He's in the, the midst of reconstituting himself. And we actually have two different faces for him. We have one that we've sort of affectionately called the battle face, which is a little more pronounced a little more severe in the face and then we have one that's kind of a dialogue face where we've taken some of those things back just to allow him to to read a little more through the makeup I've got 
wings and I fly, which is really, really cool actually, because it's an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, makeup that um, Patrick and the guys have put together. You know, he had a tough job ahead of him too, because we just piled on makeup, and he'll talk about it, that it's just, you know, Wiseman puts me in just seven hours of makeup or whatever it is, and then ask him to act through that. And he's got layers and, and, and just, I can't imagine that having to practice to see what he's doing inside the mask and what's actually being seen on the outside. They put my mask on, you know, they put my jacket on, they put my teeth in, they put my eyes in, they cover me in blood, and they go, right, go on, <laughs> act. Why would I listen to your lies when the journey to the truth is so much sweeter.